All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us together tonight. We would ask that you would open our ears to hear what you want us to hear, and to open our hearts and let that message sink into our hearts. Please be with us, be with our speakers, and help us to, as always, to live your message out every day in our lives. And we say, Our Father, who art Christ in heaven, heaven hallowed be, be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will, will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you very much for being here. My name is Dennis Kellogg. I'm the Director of Communications for the Diocese of Lincoln. And uh, I want to especially thank St. Mary's Church for allowing us to have uh, this presentation here tonight. Um, this presentation is something, uh, part of a program that we call Prepare and Proclaim, uh, Enriching Ourselves for Our Mass Experience. And this is uh, the first year that we're doing this program, and it started with a partnership with the McGrath Institute for Church Life. And our speakers tonight are from McGrath and the University of Notre Dame, so we're excited to have them here. Um, but it also began in earnest last spring when we met with uh, high school students and college students. We met with priests, and uh, we also met with parishioners from across the diocese in a series of focus groups and we asked them, and we wanted to learn where are we as a diocese right now when it comes to our Catholic faith? What are we doing right, and what do we need to get better at? And so things like tonight are what are coming out of those focus group meetings, and we appreciate the people from Notre Dame making the trip in to help us with that. So it's called Prepare and Proclaim Enriching Our Mass Experience. And you know the whole point is to learn more about our Catholic faith, but also to find ways that we can better prepare ourselves uh, for Mass on Sundays and to be fertile soil for those homilies from our priests on Sunday as well. So um, we have two very good speakers with us tonight. Uh, a little bit later on we're going to hear from Carolyn Pirtle who's going to talk about art and scripture uh, and the beauty that we can find in God through art and scripture. But we're going to begin uh, with Dr. Joshua McManaway who is from the McGrath Institute and the University of Notre Dame. He's the program director for Savoring the Mystery, which is the overall arching program for this uh, that we're partnering with him. He's an assistant professor of the practice and his PhD is in theology from the University of Notre Dame. Um, it, some of his research, research focus has been on the history of Christian thought. Uh, and he's also currently working on a book that's gonna be published in 2025 on the Apostles' Creed. So you can look for that next year. So the purpose, or the, the title of his talk tonight, is Reading Scripture as a Christian, uh, Finding Christ on Every Page. So please help me give a Nebraska welcome to Dr. <laughs> Joshua McManaway. Thanks, Dennis. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, friends. Can everybody in the back hear me okay? All right, good. I'm used to lecturing to big rooms, but I want to make sure. Um, so, as Dennis mentioned, uh, I'm a theology professor at Notre Dame. Um, I'm a convert to Catholicism, and I came out of uh, an evangelical background where, you know, we loved scripture. And uh, so it's my, it's my real pleasure to come here tonight to talk to you about reading scripture. Now, when I, when I talk to a lot of people in Catholic world, uh-oh, let's see. let's see if I can maybe move that. Okay, great. When I talk to uh, people in Catholic world about you know, reading scripture, especially the Old Testament, I get a sense that faithful Catholics feel kind of daunted by the prospect of reading all of those books with those bizarre Hebrew names in bizarre places. You know, you're not quite sure when this happened, where it happened. And so the text can feel quite distant. Or even if you're reading uh, you know, the New Testament in the Greco-Roman world, in the Roman Empire, it still feels sometimes like that text is 2,000 years removed from anything I'm concerned about in 2024. So how can I responsibly read this text if I don't have time to become a historian, if I don't have time to learn Greek and Hebrew? Right? That seems onerous. And so 
it's easy just not to do it. But I suggest that a Catholic reading of Scripture is not one that's primarily concerned with recovering the text in its historical context. Right? To be a Catholic is not to become an archaeologist. It's not to become a historian. Uh, historical questions are very interesting and useful. Archaeological questions are very interesting and useful. But to be a Catholic is not principally to become a historian of the Bible. What we're concerned with is reading the text, reading scripture right, in the light of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so a Catholic reading of scripture, I'm going to say tonight, is one that finds Christ on every page, not just in the Gospels, not just in the New Testament generally, but on every page of scripture, we as Catholics can find Christ. Okay, is that how scripture reads itself? Am I about to propose to you a kind of unfair way of reading scripture? Am I rigging the game? Am I making it too easy? Should you really become a historian and an archeologist and a linguist and all of the other things it would take? Well, let me give you a little example. Maybe some of you remember this show. Anyone remember, name that tune? Okay. I'm only 40, so this wasn't on when I was, you know, coming up. But I do know, I know the show. All right, what's the, what's the premise of name that tune? The idea is somebody says, I can name that song in four notes. And then the other person says, I can name that song in three notes. And I can name that song in two notes, you know. And you knew somebody was really bold when they thought they could do it in one note. All right, that, that was the very bold person. But the idea, right, is that you could hear just a few notes and you'd have the whole song in your head. This happens to me all the time. You know, maybe I pass somebody on campus who's humming a song, and suddenly, you know, I just, I, the whole song comes flooding into my mind, not just those notes. So does scripture read itself this way? Well, let's do a little test. Here's a phrase from scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Anybody else got a, another answer? Interesting. Okay, this is great. Nebraska Catholics are biblically literate. This is what I want to see. You know, I'm used to, used to having to kind of fudge the data a little bit, but you guys are great. Okay, fantastic, right? In the beginning, in Genesis, says God created the heavens and the earth. St. John, writing his gospel uh, much later, picks up this phrase, in the beginning, and then switches it around on you. Was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. I want you to imagine yourself as a first century Jew who's heard the phrase in the beginning thousands of times. You know exactly where this text is going. No big deal. And then John switches it around. Why? Why does he use this phrase in the beginning? Is he just trying to show off? Oh, look how biblically literate I am. Oh, I know the Bible. I can, I can pepper in some language from scripture. Is that the point? I don't think so. If John is giving you a few notes and is trying to draw in the whole song, what's the whole song of Genesis 1? Creation. He's trying to draw in the entire theme of creation into his book, but he's doing it in a new way, right? He draws on the theme of creation by using those three words and then tells you, this is different. Now I'm, I'm sharing something new about creation. Right? You didn't know this, but actually at the beginning of creation was the word. It also says that whatever John is about to do in his gospel has to do with a new creation. Right? And there are lots of these Old Testament themes that pop up in John's gospel. Jesus' story is very much Israel's story retold throughout the gospels, but John, John loves to retell these kinds of stories. Okay? So it seems that scripture really does kind of read itself this way likes to make lots of allusions and references, but then it does so in order to kind of highlight a new aspect, something new revealed in the person of Jesus. But what justifies this sort of reading? Do I think, for instance, that the author of Genesis 1 sat down and had in mind the exact same thing that the evangelist John had when he wrote John 1.1? 1, 1? Absolutely not. I don't think that, and I don't think he had to have that in mind. 
I, I imagine that that guy would have looked at John's gospel and been very surprised about where he had taken his little phrase. In the beginning was the word. What do you mean by that? Right, so there are lots of moves in the, in the New Testament where they take up Old Testament texts and rework them. Well, why? The kind of central claim I want to make is that it's in light of the person of Jesus. So let's start here with this text, Dei Verbum. Dei Verbum is the document from the Second Vatican Council that deals with Christian revelation. Um, There's a very interesting history uh, to this document. Joseph Ratzinger, who would later become Pope Benedict, had a a huge hand in developing Dei Verbum. Uh, And I think it's it's a beautiful, beautiful text. But a lot of times when I ask people, you know, what is revelation? They'll say, oh, it's scripture. Scripture's revelation. And that's true. Scripture is revelation. But the revelation is Christ. Dave Verbum says this, Therefore Christ the Lord, in whom the full revelation of the supreme God is brought to completion, commissioned the apostles to preach to all men. Christ is the ultimate revelation of God. If you want to know what kind of God it is that you worship, you look at a crucifix. That is God. If you want to know the full meaning of every single scripture from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation, to the end of Apocalypse, all right, it's that crucified Lord, crucified and risen Lord for you. That is the full meaning of scripture. Scripture is a reality that points to that person. So always keep that in mind as you're reading. You should find that person on every page. All stories point to that person. But where where does Dei Verbum get off saying this? Okay, so let's go to the actual New Testament itself and think a little bit about what those authors say. I'm sorry, I know this isn't showing up. This is Rembrandt's version of Paul. He's very, you know, he's contemplating. He's wondering what he's going to write. But in this this letter written to the church at Corinth, St. Paul says this, We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example. And they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. Who is it that put God to the test? Who is it that Paul is talking about here? Anyone know? No, so, yeah, that would be, that's a really interesting, uh, interesting take. I think he has an Old Testament reference in mind. Job. Oh, Job, yeah, I mean, well, yeah, Job is kind of long-suffering with God. What I love about Job is God says, Job is the one who's spoken rightly. Um, God likes what Job has to say in the book. It's his friends who are the kind of chuckleheads. No, I think this is probably the wilderness generation who put God to the test, right? So the, this is the generation who are brought out of Egyptian slavery, right? Remember the end of Genesis closes with Joseph bringing Israel and the family down into Egypt because there's an abundance of grain, right? So Genesis closes out. Pharaoh is very happy with Joseph. Hundreds of years go by. Exodus opens up. There arose a king in Egypt who did not know Joseph. God liberates his people from Egyptian slavery, right? Takes them out across the Red Sea just on the cusp of the promised land. They're kind of wandering. And the people grumble. Remember, they grumble because they, they long for the flesh pots of Egypt, as one translation says. Right? I would love to be a slave if only I got to eat cheese pizza back in Egypt. That's how I teach it to my students, cheese pizza. Can you imagine? Right? Can you imagine the idea that you would actually prefer Egyptian slavery rather than liberation under God, because being out in the desert is hard for a little while. And so at least you had the flesh pots in Egypt. But what St. Paul is doing here is showing you that we are in some sense this wilderness generation. Do not put Christ to the test as some of them did. Right? This is a now reality. It's not just Israel is a kind of historical reality and we can look at it. No, he's saying actually that the the wilderness generation way back in Exodus, and in parts of Numbers, way back in Exodus, put Christ to the test. 
And then he says this very curious phrase, these things were written down to instruct us. The Old Testament records are there in order to teach the people of God now. Those realities are actually our realities. If you read the Exodus story and you think, ugh, Israel, what a bunch of boneheads. I would never, you know, I'm so much better than those. No, no, you are the boneheads too. I apologize for calling you boneheads, but you see what I'm saying, right? We're all boneheads. We're all people who, liberated by God's grace, desire paltry things like flesh pots and cheese pizza over God. We do that. But Paul is, is making this really interesting point. It was Christ they rebelled against. He was there all along. Let's keep moving along. Paul has this to say. This is a Moses in the flaming bush. This is a mosaic uh, from a floor in a church in Ravenna. You've got kind of the, the flames all around Moses and then the hand of God you know, reaching out down to, God, down to Moses. But Paul has this really striking claim in Romans 10 another letter that he wrote to the church, this one at Rome. And he says, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. You could read end here as though Paul meant Christ puts an end to the law. No more law. No more of that Old Testament stuff. But that isn't what Paul is saying. Paul is saying Christ is the goal of the law. Because the goal of the law, according to Leviticus, is you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. God gives the law to Israel in order to instruct them how to be like him. Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Jesus is the one who finally gets it right. Jesus is the one man in Israel's history who lives out the law perfectly. Christ is the goal of the law. If you want to see what a life lived according to God's holiness looks like, you look to the person of Jesus. But do you see how he's reading Jesus back kind of into the law? The guy who wrote Leviticus probably was not thinking, oh yeah, one day there's going to be a first century Jewish guy named Jesus of Nazareth who will do this perfectly. No. But Paul, standing on this side of Christian revelation, can look back and see Jesus there. Here's probably the most famous kind of New Testament justification for finding Christ on every page. This is the road to Emmaus, the story told in Luke's gospel. It's one of my favorites uh, for lots and lots of reasons. This is after Jesus' resurrection, and he catches these, these two guys. You know, they're journeying away. They're going to Emmaus. Jesus says to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. The implication of this passage is radical, incredible. Jesus tells these two on this road to Emmaus, that everything they had read back in Moses and the prophets is actually about him. Okay? It's not just the Old Testament text is a super long on-ramp until you finally get to the real story. It's not, oh, we have to read this as, you know, the first book in a, in a trilogy or something like that, you know, where the author hasn't quite gotten their legs and they needed an editor to shorten it down or something. No. Every text that you find in the Old Testament is about Jesus, according to Jesus himself. I'll do one more. This one is not scripture. This one comes from a letter by a man uh, of the name of Ignatius of Antioch. Has anyone ever heard of Ignatius of Antioch before? Yeah, okay. Very famous early Christian martyr. Dies probably around 107-ish. Um, but he was the, the bishop of Antioch and was captured by the Romans and taken from Antioch to Rome to be martyred. While he journeyed across the Mediterranean from Antioch, which is basically in modern-day Syria, traveled across the, the Mediterranean, he wrote a series of letters to churches around the Mediterranean, and we have those letters today. But in one of these letters, he talks about these people 
who are arguing with him. And he says, look, when I heard some say, quote, unless I find it in the official records, in the gospel, I do not believe. And when I answered them, it is in the scriptures, they retorted, this is just the point at issue. But to me, the official record is Jesus Christ. The inviolable record is his cross and his death and resurrection and the faith of which he is the author. Ignatius is saying that his, his interlocutors, the people with whom he is arguing, are trying to make the case that because they can't find these things explicitly stated, you know, I go back to Exodus and I can't find something explicitly about Jesus, I don't believe it. It's not in the records. What is Ignatius saying? The records are Jesus. Everything has to be understood in light of his person, his life, his death, his resurrection. So yes, it's not stated explicitly. But with the eyes of faith, as we're going to see some other authors argue, with the eyes of faith, you begin to see how Israel's story and Jesus' story are very much one story. This is a, a picture of him. He describes the Roman soldiers taking him as a band of leopards. Uh, and so this picture is trying to you know, capture that, uh, which I really love. Okay. So let's think a little bit about Christian reading of the Old Testament. Because the accusation is leveled. Oh, you're, you're just doing violence to the text. That's not what the text says, right? The Exodus is about a group of Israelites who are taken out of Egypt. Joshua is only about conquering the Holy Land, the land of Canaan, okay? First and second Kings is only about the Davidic kings uh, from Solomon on. But the New Testament certainly doesn't think that. And one thing I love to ask people is, why do we even have an Old Testament? I ask this in lots of settings with lots of different groups. I ask it of my undergraduates. I ask it when I, I give talks like this one. Why do we even have an Old Testament? You know, is it just the world's longest on-ramp to the story of Jesus? It's a really long on-ramp, friends. I mean, before Mother, Father Mike Schmitz did his Bible in a year, you know, everyone was like, I'm going to be a new person January 1, I'm going to finally read the whole Bible. And then they would get to Leviticus and think, uh, maybe, maybe not, okay? Right? Maybe, maybe do, you, know, you get to Deuteronomy, you've really muscled through, and then that kills your, your steam, right? Is that all it is, though? Do we just keep this collection of books around because they're really old, and I guess you know, we have to have them? How about can the Old Testament be read as Christian scripture, explicitly Christian scripture, can we find Christ therein? Something to keep in mind as we answer this question. Can we find Christ therein? Is he really there? It's fundamental for Catholics to remember that each book of Scripture has a genuine human author who was nevertheless inspired by God. And so... When we do our historical investigation, right, when we do kind of put, our, put on our historian's cap and we dig into what was going on in the life of the prophet Jeremiah, for instance, one of my favorites, or the prophet Amos, all right, these minor prophets that you're like, oh yeah, that is a book in the Bible. I remember that. Yeah, right? He, Amos, he's in there. He's a great read. It's, it's wonderful to know the historical context, and I make my students know that. But Jeremiah can say things inspired by the Holy Spirit in a genuinely human way that he himself did not realize the full significance of. The full significance of what Jeremiah says, for instance, in Jeremiah 31, where he promises a new covenant. The, on, the only time you, know, you find in the Old Testament new covenant language is made. Because you, you go back to Exodus, and it's like, this covenant is going to last forever. Forever and ever and ever, this covenant that we make at Sinai. And then Jeremiah comes in and says, no, actually, there's a new covenant. The New Testament picks this up all over the place. One of those places is the Eucharist. What does Christ say? This is the blood of the new covenant. He's hearkening back to Jeremiah 31. Did Jeremiah have to know that that's what was going to happen? No. But the Holy Spirit knew that that was what was going to happen. Right? The Holy Spirit can write 
at a kind of 30,000 foot level, even if the human authors are kind of just down here at cruising, you know, cruising low level or something like that. The Holy Spirit can have these human authors in genuinely human ways write things whose significance is kind of blown up, you know, in the New Testament. So it's important that we remember that Scripture is both a human product, it is genuinely a historical product of real human people, but also it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to skip over that. It's a good recommendation. I'm just going to skip the, the slide. It's a book by Jean Danielou, who's a, a French Jesuit in the early 20th century. And this book uh, details how the early Christians, the church fathers, read the Old Testament. It's really, really uh, a fantastic little book. Okay. So I work on the history of Christianity, um, and I work especially in the early church. So I thought it would be fitting to maybe talk about how these early Christians worked this out. How did they receive these Old Testament documents, which are quite different from the New Testament documents in many respects? And in fact, I'm going to kind of make the, the radical claim that the only reason we have an Old Testament is because they figured out how to read the Old Testament with Christ in there. They figured out how to read the Old Testament spiritually. It never would have lasted if they thought its only value was a historical on-ramp. Right? They would have jettisoned it. They would have figured out how to do away with it. But they began to read it in really new and beautiful ways. We'll see some examples. But for instance, this quote from Irenaeus of Lyon. Irenaeus lives in the late second century. He's uh, the bishop of the French town that we now call Lyon. Back then, it was called in Latin, Lugdunum, which is less beautiful. <laughs> so we don't call him Irenaeus of Lugdunum. Uh, Irenaeus of Lyon. And he writes this about these so-called Gnostics. These were, uh, this was an early Christian movement that thought that matter was very bad. This kind of stuff right here, not good. And that the whole point of Christianity is to liberate me from this meat suit that I'm walking around with. This meat suit that gets sick every fall because my students bring all sorts of germs back to Notre Dame, right? This meat suit that I've torn my MCL three times. You can see I'm kind of sympathetic to the Gnostic position, right? It's like, yeah, maybe liberation from this body is a good idea. Um, they think the, the created material world is a mistake. Again, if you've been to South Bend in the winter, you're very sympathetic to the Gnostics. You, know? you might look around and think, who made this place? Not a good God. Why is it so cold? Okay. But Irenaeus is one of the Orthodox Church Fathers who writes against these Gnostics. And he says, no, matter is a good thing. The Creator God is a good God. He created out of love. But look at what he says about how they go awry when they read scripture. He says, such is their system, their system of reading, their method, which neither the prophets preached, nor the Lord taught, nor the apostles handed down. Right? For Irenaeus, if it isn't an apostolic tradition, if, it, if he can't trace it back to the apostles, he doesn't want it. But he continues. Right? This is also a huge faux pas. You're never supposed to put a wall of text on a PowerPoint, but I've done it, and I'm so sorry. I just, you know the rules to break the rules. Okay, he says, they transfer passages and rearrange them, and making one thing out of another, they deceive many by the badly composed fantasy of the Lord's words that they adapt. By way of illustration, suppose, so he's saying, here's what their method looks like to me. Suppose someone would take the beautiful image of a king carefully made out of precious stones by a skilled artist, so like a mosaic, and would destroy the features of the man on it and change around and rearrange the jewels and make the form of a dog or of a fox out of them, and that a rather bad piece of work. In other words, what do these Gnostics do? They go into the Old Testament scriptures, and it's like they go up to a mosaic of Christ, and instead of Christ, they take out all the stones and they put them back, all the same stones, but now it looks like a fox. Now it looks like a dog. The point is, it's another Jesus. 
It's not the Jesus who actually came and started his church and taught us and gave us the gospel. It's an entirely different Jesus, even though they're using the same parts. Well, how does Irenaeus know that they're wrong? Because Jesus is his standard, right? Jesus, who is the creator, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Jesus, who is that creator God, who created out of love, who saves out of love, who really took up a real human body, right? The Gnostics thought uh, he couldn't have taken a real body. Matter is bad. Why would he take up a meat suit? Right? He must have just seemed to have taken up a meat suit. Irenaeus says, that's not the gospel. You have rearranged the pieces, right? You've kept to the same pieces, but you have rearranged them into a system that does not portray the real king. But reverse that. The implication is the standard by which Irenaeus knows something is true is Christ. Whenever he goes reading the Old Testament, he finds Christ all over the place. Okay, this is one of my favorite lines from a, another patristic author. This is Origen of Alexandria, a masterful Christian theologian in the third century. He dies in about 254. Um, and he has this really great line where he's talking about how do we know that we as Christians don't have to read, for instance, Leviticus literally. If I were to take, for instance, Leviticus as though it were talking to me, Right? I'd have to avoid shellfish. I couldn't mix fabrics. Uh, I'd need to offer all sorts of sacrifices that I can't offer because there isn't a temple right now. So without a temple and without my belonging to the people of Israel way back when, of what value is the book of Leviticus? Why would I read it as a Christian? And Origen says, look, here's a clue that you're not supposed to just read it like a literal historical account. He says, if we come to the legislation of Moses, the Torah, many of the laws manifest the irrationality and others the impossibility of their literal observance. I can't go to the temple and offer a sacrifice. The irrationality in this, that the people are forbidden to eat vultures, okay? In Leviticus 11 and Leviticus 14, there's a law that says don't eat vultures. Although no one, even in the direst famines, was ever driven by want to have recourse to this bird. In other words, nobody has ever been so hungry they want to eat a vulture. <laughs> you certainly don't have to legislate against this. You know, you don't need a standing law where it's like, oh, that vulture looks really good, and I would chow down. I would eat a vulture runza. That's me pandering, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I know one thing, you know. Right? You don't need to make a law against people eating vultures. So why is it in there? What Origen does when he reads the book of Leviticus, the thing that slows you down in your Bible for a year program, he reads it all as symbols of Christian mysteries. The, the, the clothing that the priests wear in the Old Testament disclose something about Christ. The sacrifices they make disclose something about Christ. The food laws tell you something about Christ. Every little bit of Leviticus is read by origin through the lens of Christ. It's really, really brilliant. Let's see. Okay, this is another one of my little favorite passages from origin. He says this. As in the last days... The word of God, which was clothed with the flesh of Mary, proceeded into this world. Right? So the son comes to us incarnate in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He takes up a real body. The eternal son does this. What was seen in him was one thing. What was understood was something else. Anyone running around first century Judea would have looked at Jesus and just seen another first century Judean. Right? There doesn't seem to have been anything remarkable about his appearance. He didn't walk around with a halo. Right? He wasn't always kind of transfigured and letting his glory shine, shine forth. He just looked like a regular dude. But with the eyes of faith, right, you, the apostles come to know who he is. His flesh, in some sense, hides his divinity. That's what the transfiguration is about. For that moment, he discloses himself as God and then kind of, you know, back until the, the crucifixion. 
But look what Origen does here. He says, so also, when the word of God was brought to humans through the prophets and the lawgiver, the words that God spoke to the prophets, to the authors of scripture. So word of God becomes incarnate. Word of God becomes written in the Bible. When this word of God that gets written, it was not brought without proper clothing. For just as it was covered with the veil of flesh, so here with the veil of the letter, so that indeed the letter is seen as flesh, but the spiritual sense hiding within is perceived as divinity. For Christians, if we just read Leviticus as a kind of historical document that you know, tells us about priestly sacrifices thousands of years ago, we're just reading the flesh. But when we do the kinds of things that Origen is able to do, we're seeing the divinity of the text. When we begin to see Christ, it discloses to us its divine origin, its divine nature. So how do we do this, though? I keep talking about doing it. Show me an example, Josh. Let's do it. If you want to learn to read the Old Testament well, copy the method of the author to the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament. We've been reading Hebrews in the Mass lately, uh, and I'm currently teaching a class on the book of Hebrews at Notre Dame. It's one of my favorites. We'll look at a couple examples of uh, his, his exegesis, how it is that he reads the Old Testament in order to teach us how to read the Old Testament. Learning from the New Testament authors how to read Scripture is the best way to learn how to read Scripture. They're masters of it. It's incredible. So let's look at this one little passage here from Hebrews 1. Okay, so the opening of Hebrews begins with a comparison between the Son and the angels of God. And the whole point that the author of Hebrews is trying to make is that the Son, as the incarnate, crucified, risen, and ascended one, is superior to the angels. But how that's so, right, might not be obvious, because you're thinking, well, this guy is a human. How could a human be higher than the angels? Okay, so the author of Hebrews is trying to explain how this is so. But the way that he argues this is through this litany of quotes, right? This, this, uh, this yeah, not hodgepodge, he does it intentionally, but through this litany of quotes from the Old Testament. So he says this, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you, from Psalm 2-7. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son, from 2 Samuel 7-14. Now, when, an, when a New Testament author quotes a passage like this, it's again, name that tune. They are not just quoting the little phrase and then moving on. What this author wants you to do is to call to mind the whole of Psalm 2, to call to mind the whole story of what's going on in 2 Samuel 7. So what's going on in, in Psalm 2? This is a, a, one of these kind of coronation psalms for one of Israel's kings, for a Davidic king. And God says to the Davidic king, you are my son, today I have begotten you. It's used at Jesus' baptism, right? And it's also used at the transfiguration. You see Psalm 2 pop up throughout the New Testament. So he's saying, this human Jesus is the fulfillment of Psalm 2. Psalm 2 was, in its kind of historical context, yes, about the Davidic kings. But today, Jesus has fulfilled this. To which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? None. But he did say it to his son, Jesus Christ. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. 2 Samuel 7. There, God is talking to King David. David says, God, I'd really love to build you a house. I want to build you a temple. And God doesn't, he didn't ask for the temple to be built. He says, I don't really need a temple. How about this? You don't get to build me a temple. You don't get to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house, meaning a genealogy. And your son is going to be my son. I will be his father and he will be my son. Talking about Solomon. What is Hebrew saying, though? 2 Samuel 7, 14 is ultimately about Jesus. Yes, in its historical context, way back when, the human author meant that this is about Solomon. Fair enough. 
but it finds its ultimate fulfillment in the person of Jesus, argues the author of Hebrews. Just as Solomon was a Davidic king who is raised to the level of God's son, so too Jesus Christ, who is God you know, for eternity and the son for eternity, but as the incarnate one is raised up into this position of being the Davidic son. Okay, here's another instance of this, one more. In Hebrews 3, the author quotes Psalm 95. He says this, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, that's interesting, attributing the psalm to the Holy Spirit and not to, you know, David, for instance. The Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. The same rebellion we were talking about earlier uh, in 1 Corinthians with St. Paul. Right? The rebellion way back when of Israel in the wilderness. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. As on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors put me to the test, though they had seen my works for 40 years. The author here is reading the rebellion of the Israelites back in Exodus 17 through Psalm 95. So he's doing an Old Testament, you know, Torah text, Exodus, reading it through the lens of the psalm. And he's trying to make this argument that because the author uses this word today, Psalm 95, written much, much later than Exodus, he's trying to say that the Israelites did not actually enter into God's rest. So he makes this argument. It says, in one place it speaks about the seventh day as follows. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place it says, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains open for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news fail to enter it because of disobedience, again he sets a certain day today, saying through David much later in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not speak later about another day. Okay, it's kind of a complex argument, but it goes like this. You might be reading along in the Old Testament. God promises Israel the Holy Land. Eventually, after many trials and tribulations, they seem to have arrived. So you might have said, great, they entered into God's rest. Check, they fulfilled it. They got into the land. Uh, but not quite. You know, you read Joshua, it's not a very smooth kind of process. Uh, you read the book of the Judges, again, very unsmooth. I mean, Israel's history is a very tumultuous one. The author of Hebrews says, yeah, David, who wrote Psalm 95, realizes this. And so he writes this phrase, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Because the idea is, sure, we haven't fully arrived in the land. We haven't fully arrived in God's rest. Hebrews picks up on Psalm 95's doubt, if you want to call it that, and says, in Jesus, you do finally arrive in this today. You do finally arrive in the promised land. You do finally arrive in God's rest. All right, let me wrap up. Some takeaways I hope that you get from tonight. One, the same spirit who inspired these scriptures is in you by virtue of your baptism and your confirmation. The same spirit active in the authors of scripture is in you. And God intends to teach you through that spirit. He has revealed himself to you for your salvation. All of scripture, again, from Genesis to the end of Revelation, is for you. I don't mean to belabor the point, friends, but I don't want you to look at the Bible and feel like that's, some, that's for somebody else. That's too distant for me. Christ is intimately present in every single word of the Bible. And the Holy Spirit who inspired those texts made sure of it so that when you as a Christian read it, you can find him therein. And he did so because he wants to save you. Okay. Second, Christ is alive and he is the meaning of all scripture. We're not just trying to dig up 2,000-year-old history. We're not Catholics because we're antiquarians. We just really love old stuff. I mean, we do love old stuff. Old stuff's great, but that's not a religion. 
Christ is alive. He's not old stuff. He's new stuff. Our reading of scripture should always be attentive to the risen Lord who revealed himself to be in the text of the Old Testament, just like he did on the road to Emmaus. Take that as your guide. Third, you're part of God's story. It very often feels like, boy, God sure did a lot of stuff back when, and it'd be nice if he'd do some stuff now. But friends, he is doing stuff now. Right this very second, the very fact that we're all sitting here is God's doing. Whether it's punishment for you, for your sins, and you're really, you know, you find this to be drudgery. (laughs) I hope not. But if it is, well, God put you in that seat. So blame him, not me. Okay, but you're part of God's story. And he doesn't stop writing it with scripture. He continues to act in our lives. He is more interior to ourselves than we are to ourselves. He is more inside of us than we are inside of ourselves. That is how close he is to us. Lastly, the one who is present to you in the Eucharist is the one present to you in the scriptures. Dei Verabum says the church has venerated the scriptures just as she venerates the Eucharist, just as she venerates the body of Christ. Right? Scripture is Jesus being present to you. It's not the appetizer, right? It's not just the like, well, it's okay, I got to read about him before I can receive him. The two in the mass go together. He is present to you in the readings. He is present to you in the Eucharist. Not in the same way, but yes, present. So what's my advice here? Read the Sunday readings before Mass and place yourself somewhere in the story. Right? Read the Good Samaritan, for instance, and put yourself in the different figures. Don't just make yourself the Good Samaritan, by the way. <laughs> okay? Make yourself the guy in the ditch who got beat up. Make yourself the, the Levite and the priests who were cowards and kind of walked away. Put yourself in the story and see how it's shaped for you differently. One of my favorites is Gethsemane, Christ there in the garden before his crucifixion, right? If I'm having a rough time, sometimes I like to imagine myself sitting there with him. Hey, me too, you know. Sometimes I like to imagine myself there consoling him. It just, it helps you read scripture more intimately. Okay. Read any Old Testament quotes in the New Testament. Read the context. If it quotes a psalm, go back and read the whole psalm, not just the the little verb, the little words. Why did the New Testament author choose this moment from Israel's history to use it in this passage? Figure out the rationale. Why did the New Testament author think this was relevant? Read the psalm for Sunday. When you read it, ask yourself, is this Christ speaking on his own behalf? Is this Christ speaking on my behalf? Because Christ is speaking all throughout the Psalms. So figure out which of those it is. Lastly, read the fathers of the church as your conversation partners. These guys are masters of reading the Bible. And this seems really difficult to do on your own. It's because it is. You're not meant to do it on your own. You're meant to read with a community. You're meant to read informed by liturgical practices in the church. You're meant to read informed by this long tradition that we have. We've had so many spiritual masters in the Catholic Church. You don't have to do all the heavy lifting by yourself. Do it with them as your conversation partners. Okay, that's it for me, friends. I uh, am going to end here, and then maybe we can take a 10-minute break before Carolyn comes. About a five-minute, but we'll, we'll we'll let Dennis call it. I'm tough. Anywhere from five to ten. Restrooms are back there. We've got a few cookies on the back table if you'd like. Stand up and stretch, and then we're going to get right into Carolyn's presentation. Great. Thank you so much, friends. Thank you. Thank you.